I'm Scott L. Miller. It's the 26th of November, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living back home in Nicaragua. Today, I'm going to be taking another break from our content on Bolivia to talk a little bit about something that a number of people have been posting a lot about on the show, and that is about the cost of living or the cost of visiting Nicaragua. And I think a lot of misinformation is being provided because well, there's a lot of reasons. We're going to get into that. So today we're going to really dig into what things really cost to give you an idea of real life here in Nicaragua because there's so many people who come down and either uh, try to approach it as if they've not left the United States or they end up getting scammed or they don't know how to purchase things. And they end up paying way too much. And then they relay that and people think that it may be a lot more expensive here than it really is. So we're going to dig into all of that right after the bump. <music> It's good to be back here in Nicaragua. I've been in Bolivia for the last few weeks, and as much as everyone likes to claim, there's no way that I can like living in a warm place where it hits the high 80s nearly every day. It is really nice to be back into the warm. I did enjoy my cool days in Bolivia, but I did not like the super dry air. I mean, in some ways I did. It helps keep me from sweating, and it makes my sinuses feel good at first, but then they get dry and cracky, and you start to kind of feel bad, and I'm actually feeling much better now that I'm back here. And of course, being at altitude doesn't do a lot to make you feel great. I did really enjoy my time in Bolivia. It is a wonderful place and I hope some of you consider maybe visiting or even relocating to Bolivia and we're going to provide as much content on that as we can both uh, based on the stuff that we've done and I'll be back in the future. Bolivia is a place that I'm tied to very strongly so no problems there but I want to while I was gone a lot of people were posting stuff about Nicaragua and I think a lot of it needs to be addressed because some of this information is incredibly wrong. One of the things, I'm just going to start off because I just read this, is someone said it's absolutely true that, that fuel, gas, petrol, costs more in Nicaragua than it does in the United States. And this is simply not true. This is a false statement that people make um, either because they're, they're confused, which is very common, um, or uh, because they're, they're trying to mislead you, of course. Um, so let's talk about this. So first of all, Nicaragua has basically a flat price across the board that's different than the United States. So here in Nicaragua, currently uh, fuel at uh, basic, not premium, it's about $5.04 per gallon. And you're gonna say, wow, that, that does sound like more than the United States. And on average, that is more than the United States. But this number is extremely mis leading and people always state it in such a way that you can see where they're trying to trick you right someone who's really trying to tell you what the what the price of fuel is going to be is going to give you a little bit more information so first of all in the United States prices vary wildly from coast to coast so these prices at five dollars and four cents is less expensive than the average in California but more expensive than say the average in Texas or nearly any other state so that makes it sound like, well, sure, there are cases where it can be more expensive in America, but really it's more expensive in Nicaragua. And you may think that. However, it's simply not true. In the United States, we normally consider uh, regular fuel, which we base all of our pricing off of, is 87 octane, and 89 is mid-grade, and somewhere between 91 and 93 are your premiums. Here in Nicaragua, our base is 95, and our premium is 97. There may be cases where you can get 99, but I can't remember having seen that, at least not in under normal circumstances. But that means the fuel that we're getting here starts at a higher grade than is generally available in the United States, and nobody's providing pricing on that. So if you see the prices even close, it means that Nicaragua is cheaper. We have more fuel efficient vehicles because they are tuned for 95 and 97 octane. You get the same thing in Europe. You go to Spain or Italy and Greece, you get these little cars with these high octane, you say, oh, the fuel's so expensive, and then it lasts forever. That's why. It's not necessarily a better system. I'm not saying that the U.S. is getting it wrong. I'm saying that there are two different approaches to how fuel is normally handled for vehicles across the board, and it creates a problem in comparing the prices between them. That's not even what really matters. When we talk about that it costs less to drive in Nicaragua, it's a much bigger picture, right? We're not getting the same vehicles here. We don't drive at the same speeds. Our roads are not the same. Our distances are not the same. What matters is that the distances that you drive, and people will say, well, that's your truth. Well, that's another way of saying I'm lying to you, 
and I'm coming up with a way to make it sound okay. This is a new American thing, right? New US and Canada people use things like that's your truth. When they know something is true, but they want to say something that false is also true, right? Listen for that when people are talking. So it's a common approach to say, well, that's how you see it, but I, I live in a different world. Well, okay, that's fine. There is realistically nobody in Nicaragua who is driving really long distances. Nobody in Nicaragua drives what is average for the US. That would be absolutely crazy. We drive very short distances at very slow speeds. What you drive in the US for a normal compute, a commute, an average commute in America would create a major problem here in Nicaragua because you just can't go those distances reasonably on a daily basis. Yes, somewhere there is somebody who comes to Nicaragua and just drives, just joyrides nonstop around the country. But I want you to find that person for me. I want you to actually sit down. I will go for a ride with them and film what it's like going around the country. I want to see who actually knows anybody. I don't mean a group of people. I'm not asking for something hard. I'm asking if you think this is how people live, I want to film somebody doing this on a day-to-day -day basis in Nicaragua, and we don't have to do it every day, but I wanna show what this is that people are using as an example, because I guarantee everyone watching the show will go, okay, that's the most ridiculous example. Obviously, you can contrive an example where there's someone who buys the most fuel-inefficient vehicle, drives at very high speed recklessly, and never stops driving all the time. And for them, somehow they make it more expensive to drive in Nicaragua. But could they do the same thing in the US and make it cheaper? That would be yet another question we'd have to analyze. But I want to see. I'm, I'm calling out anyone who says it's more expensive to drive in Nicaragua than in the United States. I'm challenging you right now to show me how. Because I've done the math. I've done the realistic what it's like. And I can't find any, any reasonable way, any rational way that you could be driving so much in Nicaragua that it's going to cost you more. Whether it's per gallon or whether it's the amount you spend per day or for your life of driving. So what's important is normal driving in Nicaragua, what we're talking about the 99.999% of people, like for real, we do extremely little driving. We do short distances. We, even if you're doing a border run, the distance isn't that far. And it doesn't matter where you're coming from, right? If you're way up in the north in Acatal, it's still not that far to the Costa Rican border. If you're coming from any reasonable population center, Leon or Granada or Managua, even Matagalpa, Esteli, it's really not that far at all. From here in Leon, we're one of the farthest cities from the border, and it's only four hours at reasonably slow speed. And when we go to do shopping, people say, oh, shopping in Managua, that's so crazy. It's only 90 minutes. It's something like 80 kilometers. Do that math, that's like 50 miles. Yeah, that's a long way to go to the grocery store. But when you're talking about going into the capital, which is a different city, to go shopping as a specialty thing once or twice a month, because if you're doing it all the time, yeah, maybe you're a business. Even then, it's not that much distance. It's less distance by a bit than like my father did every day commuting into Rochester, New York as a kid so that he could go work uh, at Eastman Kodak. The distances that Americans assume people will drive and what people actually drive in Nicaragua are very different. And it's not just what people do on a practical basis, it's what you could do, right? The crossing the, when I used to live in Dallas and we would go visit family in Houston, the distance we would drive is greater than crossing all of Nicaragua. Right, the, like the distances are just not that big and that the way you consume fuel is simply more efficient here. Now that's unfair because it's got negatives, right? Like, well, it takes longer to cross the same distance. You get stuck in traffic more often. Yeah, that's absolutely true. There are absolutely negatives to the Nicaragua experience of driving. It's, it's a crazy thing. And a lot of people don't wear seatbelts. And a lot of times you're stuck in traffic. And a lot of times there's big distances between gas stations, all kinds of negative things. But one thing that isn't negative is the cost of it. It is almost impossible to find a scenario, it does exist, but it's very contrived, to find any edge case where you're gonna spend more money on your transit in Nicaragua than you would in the United States, assuming other things to be equal, such as you're gonna buy a car in both cases, you're gonna use gas or diesel or whatever, because we have basically the same options, but some things are just different. The speeds that we go at, the distances that you get between things and how much it costs for the, the fuel and what octane rating you're able to get. Those things are just different and you have to take it as a whole. And when taken as a whole, Nicaragua, is going to cost you less. 
Likewise, I've had it said that electricity costs more in Nicaragua, and I was told flat out it's 100% more. I don't think they mean it's double the price. I think they mean that 100% of the time your per kilowatt is more expensive in Nicaragua, and I don't believe this is true. And reasons why are that coming from places in the United States where I had to use very little power, such as winter in Texas, and coming to Nicaragua where we always use a fair amount of power because it's like summer year round, and winter in Texas, you don't need to air condition. So we basically use no power. And here in Nicaragua, we're running air conditioning during those cold months. Yes, a little bit less than the hot months, but by what, 5%? Because the temperature difference is like two degrees. Uh, the amount of air conditioning that we run here on the off-peak time is the same essentially as the on-peak time, yet our cost is about 20%. That's not a close number. That's not like a, well, maybe you use somehow just use a little bit less power and uh, uh, and it's, it's still more expensive. No, this makes no sense at all. First of all, we know we're using more power here and it's only 20%. That's not even close. Now, that's just us. So yes, I can prove that 100% of the time it is not more expensive in the United States, period. That's demonstrable. Now, can it be more expensive here in Nicaragua? Absolutely. Nicaragua has a very high disparity in how much uh, electricity costs from place to place. Probably, and I'm just guessing, more than in the United States. So I don't know that for a fact. Throughout the United States, we have a relatively, to the best of my knowledge, stable cost of electricity. Absolutely, it varies. But it is not a massive variance under most circumstances. However, I do know that in Texas, you would get thousand percent differences between different people's bills. So it does vary a bit. When we got down to our lowest, it took years of working with different uh, billing mechanisms to find the cheapest ones. And it's still easily five times what we pay here in Nicaragua. So we're talking about massive differences. And when I lived in New York, we still paid similarly about four to seven times what we do here in Nicaragua, um, even for the lowest points of the year, not for the highest. Uh, so given, giving uh, the United States every possible advantage in our comparison, it still fails by massive D uh, degrees. But I do know that when I lived in Nicaragua previously, we paid a ton for electricity, far more than we would in the United States. We also know we were being scammed by our landlords. That's not the same as having Nicaragua uh, electric be expensive. That's just someone scamming you. Now, if you live in a city center, like the center of Managua, center of Granada, center of Leon, you're going to pay a premium. There is a essentially an electricity tax for people who live in the expensive city centers. Expensive being a relatively t relative term, of course. If you live in those zones, you're going to pay quite a bit more electricity than you will in outer areas. For example, when we lived in Labo Rio, which is not the highest uh, in, in this zone here in Leon, but it is much more like downtown, we were paying quite a bit more than we are here in Sutiava by a pretty significant amount. Here we typically pay about $45 and our absolute peak is about 80. There our minimum was more like 80 and our peak was more like 180. So that's quite a bit more, uh, double, maybe even triple, but at no point were we paying as much in Labo Rio as we would have to pay at our minimum anywhere in the United States that we've experienced. And we've never experienced California where I think it costs even a little bit more, but I could be wrong. Um, so those those experiences can can vary things a lot. And if you're someone who is cranking air conditioning here and using it in a way you would never use it in the United States because you think things are going to be really cheap and then they end up being more and you live in a super city center and you don't have good airflow, there's ways to create expensive electricity situations, obviously. Anything you do, there's a way to waste money. And electricity is no exception. And there is a lot of people who repeat that electricity is expensive in Nicaragua, and a lot of people who take advantage of gringos who believe that, and it has become a trend for landlords who think that their gringo tenants will not figure out how to do the math, won't track their meter, won't talk to the electric company, won't look up the kilowatts, and will end up paying too much. That is a very real thing. This is important. That is your landlord stealing from you. That is not your electric bill being high. There's going to be people who have electricity bills in Nicaragua, and it's going to be high. That is going to happen. But those same people doing the same thing in the United States would also be very high in almost all circumstances. I'm not saying that 100% of the time, Nicaragua electricity is cheaper than the United States. I'm convinced that is not true. I am sure that there are situations in Nicaragua where it does cost more than the United States. And when we moved back from the United States to Nicaragua, we were prepared for much higher bills because we had been scammed in the past. 
But as soon as we got here and talked to Nicaraguans, they immediately said there's no way that anyone in Nicaragua, no matter where you live, would pay that much. No matter what you're doing, you were scammed. And now that we pay our own bills and don't have a pass through a landlord, we are very much aware that that is true. So I expect that the majority of people who are saying that electricity is high in Nicaragua are either just getting it as hearsay because it does get repeated in the gringo communities if you were to go onto like facebook groups you would expect to get all kinds of bad information if you're on reddit you would expect all kinds of bad information about this or if you just rented casually and didn't have someone who is local watching out for you or you didn't do your research or just you're new to the country the chances that you're going to be taken advantage of is often very high we talk about all the time on this channel how people try to approach things in nicaragua like they're in the united states they go through a real estate agent, for example, and they'll convince themselves that they're being treated great and that someone's watching out for them and that they're getting a good deal because no one wants to admit that they're, they got taken advantage of, especially if they didn't catch it. But that's probably the reality in the majority of these cases. If you're seeing high electricity costs, it's almost certainly because something else is going on. Why would your electricity cost that much? It doesn't make any sense, especially as Nicaragua is a provider to much of the region. We generate our own green power on a massive scale with wind and solar and geothermal and hydroelectric. We don't have a really strong need for super expensive electricity. That said, we've talked about this on the channel before. If you're using above a certain threshold, you do pay more than the average because people who use extremely little get it subsidized by the people who use it more and makes it almost free, which is a system I love. I love that we have the ability to use as much electricity as we want. We pay a little bit extra for it and other people who can't afford electricity otherwise get it for free. I think it's a great system. So I'm very happy with that, but it's important to understand that you are going to pay disproportionate uh, compared to people who are very poor. That's fine. Uh, and that does give an opportunity for it to be a little bit more expensive than in the US where everyone pays basically a flat fee and it's more equal. Um, so there is an opportunity, even though they have all this green production, to have fair pricing still cost a little bit more, but that's not what we see on the ground. And across the board from people we know who actually check on their electricity and make sure they're not being ripped off by their landlords, I have yet to have any person provide me with information where it costs more. Only people who are either repeating hearsay or not providing information, or clearly were ripped off like I was in the past, have reported higher electricity costs. I am, again, I am sure that there are cases where it is more expensive. I just have not encountered them, and in requesting that information from the community have not been granted it. So if any of you have actual power bills from the actual power company that show a kilowatt cost that is actually higher than in the United States, uh, I would like to see it because that would be really useful information for everyone. What kilowatts are you actually paying? And I will try to get mine as well because the amount we pay is fantastic but I don't know where they provide that. So if you have that, I'd love to see it. If you have a power bill that claims you owe all kinds of money and it's, it's super expensive, like, let us see that. What kind of house is this, is this cooling? What are you doing that's generating all this electricity? How is it being measured? So forth. We need to answer these questions because everybody has these stories of negative things. But when we ask for details, we rarely get them, right? There are times that bad things happen. Absolutely. It's a country, right? Everything happens somewhere. But the averages, the costs, the official prices just aren't that expensive. And it, this goes for travel and living. Now, these items were living. These are things that really only affect you when you live here. But it's important to understand that if you live here and make sure you're doing things normally, like a normal Nicaraguan, your electricity should not be expensive. Maybe it's not going to save you money from the US, but it certainly could. And if it was something that was important for you, it certainly will. You have the ability to control it. You can make sure you're living in places that have super cheap electricity. That's an option for you, right? And of course, you can obviously live in places with cheaper electricity in the United States too, but I don't think you can find ones that are as cheap. And you can absolutely get fuel here that is cost effective and you don't have to drive all over cons consistently, right? It's not like you're going to be coming here and starting a logistics firm driving trucks around. I guess technically you could, but I've never met any gringo who has ever even suggested such a thing. It doesn't make very much sense. It's not a business that people want to do. And uh, it's a very tough one here that would only benefit uh, or only be a business benefit to someone who knew the local environment and had those connections. It is something that makes absolutely no sense for a gringo to approach. So the, the fringe cases where we expect fuel to be a big negative for uh, someone moving here, don't really apply to any real world scenario that we know. 
Likewise, I had someone say that flights into Nicaragua are absolutely super expensive, never less than $1,000. So I really quickly looked and got some pricing on this because again, this is one of those things we hear a lot. People are like, but it's so expensive to get there. And I'm like, why, do, why does everyone else think it's so expensive when whenever I go to look, it's not. So there are four airlines that fly from, this is specifically from the United States. There are four airlines that fly from the US to Nicaragua. That is American, United, and Spirit, which are American owned airlines and uh, Avianca, which is a Colombian-owned airlines, although I think the flights are operated by TACA, which is technically the Salvadoran division of Avianca and, and technically a separate airlines. Whatever, those four, right? Three American and one foreign. So I looked up their prices, and hopefully I'll get these correct uh, when I state them, but they are roughly, and this is important, with Spirit, which is far and away the one I would prefer. Of all of these, having flown for eight years to and from Nicaragua, every time I can, I fly Spirit. I've had people say, oh my gosh, what are you doing? Using Spirit? Trust me, I use Spirit intentionally. That it's the best, and it is ranked very well in the United States now. In uh, customer surveys, Spirit is ranked from people who actually fly it as one of Americans' favorite airlines because they treat you great and they give you what they say and their seats are more comfortable than normal. They have special seats that actually give you more space and let you breathe more. It's fantastic and that their prices are really low is amazing. But I would choose Spirit over any other airlines that operates out of the United States 100% of the time if I was given the option, even if it costs up to like 20% more. I would pay more for Spirit. It is an excellent airlines. So look for people who are like, ah, Spirit, Either they don't have experience flying, or they've had some bad experience with it, or they're trying to push a point. Normally, I think it's that last one. I don't know anyone who's flown Spirit and really had a negative experience. Some people don't agree with me that the seats are more comfortable. Some people, um, a lot of people have flown and they don't really do their due diligence. They don't look at their luggage allowances. They screw it up and then get angry that the airline doesn't have a lot of accommodations. Those accommodations on other airlines come by overbilling you for things you probably won't use. And then when you do use it, well, you already paid for it. Right, with Spirit, you don't overpay, you just pay for what you use, and if you're used to other airlines where you pay extra so that you can screw up your planning, well, you're going. That's, that's on you, right? I've had very few experiences where anyone had something negative to say about Spirit, where the thing wasn't, I screwed up and I'm angry that Spirit didn't make it free, that they didn't absorb my mistakes. That's not really fair. Um, but so Spirit is my preferred airlines. And I mean that. And I want to tell a quick anecdote. When I lived here in 2015, we had flown down on United and we had a return flight uh, on United as well. It was scheduled. Um, we were living here for a long time, so it was very far out. Uh, and we had an emergency. We needed to fly home on a bereavement rate and we called United. We did not ask for a bereavement flight. We only wanted a bereavement rescheduling or change on our ticket. United took advantage of that situation to try to charge us essentially 100% the cost of a new ticket in order to make a change to an existing ticket on a bereavement rate. It wasn't just a bereavement, uh, a lack of bereavement um, um, discount. It was a taking advantage of a bereavement situation. We refused to pay that extortion fee we called around. The only other airline that was flying to where we needed to go was Spirit. And Spirit said, we can't give you a bereavement rate. We don't really have one. We can only give you the, and I think the price was about $130, normal rate. And we were like, the what now? And we flew back on Spirit. Instead of a thousand something on United, it was a hundred and something. So one tenth the cost on Spirit and the flight was better. So we were treated better as a first time customer with Spirit with no special uh, accommodations than United was treating someone who was just making a change of tickets. The degree to which I'm saying that there is no way someone can say Spirit isn't the best airlines, it's just how can someone think they can say that and not have us go, what are you talking about? Obviously they're the nice ones, right? United is famous for how badly they treat people. Recently we had people fly on American and get scammed and literally get stuck for a couple days in Miami because American simply bumped them from a flight in a way that there's very little protections for in the United States. They lied about COVID requirements in Nicaragua so that they could bump someone from a flight. And there's very little protection you have to, in theory, you can hire a lawyer and go do something about it, but it's too late. You're stuck in some city where they dump you indefinitely until they allow you to fly. 
In this case, they stuck someone for almost a week as they scrambled to go get a COVID test that they didn't need because Nicaragua had no such requirement. And when they got here, Nicaragua didn't ask for anything because there is no such requirement. American Airlines simply made it up because they needed to bump someone from a flight and they didn't want to have to pay the bump penalty. This is a common thing. Iberia has done that to people going into Costa Rica as well. Falsified uh, requirement documents that are obviously you can show them the, the government website. Say this isn't the law. They say, I don't care. Right. And that's a common tactic today. Likewise, I have personally been bumped a number of times on Avianca when Avianca simply didn't fill out the paperwork on their side that's required for someone to fly into Nicaragua. They would just not fill out the paperwork, not answer the phone and bump you from the flight because Nicaragua had not pre-approved you. This is something that the airlines have to do. You can't do it yourself or at least at the time they had to, and that was their tactic for bumping people. So we've had really horrific experiences with all the airlines except for Spirit flying in. That said, what are the actual prices? And remember, you always state prices in one way. You never state a round trip without saying and back, right? It doesn't make any sense. You don't know if people are returning. You don't know if they're going on somewhere else. You don't know if they're when they're going back. There's so many unknowns. One way is the only way that you ever state a flight the same as you would with a bus, with a taxi, with anything, right? How If you ask how long does it take to get somewhere, you don't give a round trip time, right? It's one direction. But it, you'd be amazed how many times people say, but that's not round trip. Like, of course it's not. I didn't say it was. Why would you assume it's round trip? That makes no sense. Never do that. If you are someone who has done that, please stop. Prices, times, all those coordinations for flights are one way unless you are stating a specific case where you're doing round trip. It's very confusing when people do that. And it, it doesn't make any sense because in no other circumstances do we do that. It's like a specific trying to make airlines sound twice as expensive as they actually are when comparing against other things. It's very misleading. So with Spirit, current flights between Miami and Nicaragua, and all these are direct. They're just a little bit over two hours, definitely under three hours, uh, is $106. Flying on American is, I believe, $186 or $196, well under $200. Uh, Flying on United was quite a bit more expensive, somewhere in the 300s. I don't remember the exact number, something like uh, 356. Everything ended in a six. And then surprisingly, Avianca at the cheapest, I've never seen this, at $46.20 to fly down from Miami. Now, I don't like flying Avianca. All of those are, you know, looking, uh, I, we picked the same date for all of them and just gave a couple days leeway to make sure we're getting the, the good prices. There's always a, an expensive day or whatever, but if you are in any way being flexible, if you're any way trying to be price conscious and you're flying, flying for uh, between $50 and $350 is the only way to fly. There were no flights available that I couldn't even find a flight that cost $1,000. Now, maybe if you're paying for a premium seat with lay flat, you want, you know, meals included, you want someone to drive you to the airport, you want your hotels included on your, on your airline bill, you want to overpay so you get points. I'm sure there's ways that you can convince an airline to take more money, but no airlines is advertising a flight to Nicaragua that comes to even half of what people are stating is the minimum number for coming down. I realize that not everyone wants to fly bargain airlines, but remember, I said that Spirit is the one that we use as the guide because it is the highest quality airline flying in America, in my opinion, and ranked number two, according to JD Power, or whoever ranks those things. And when coming to Nicaragua, there's only four to choose from, and it's middle of the road as far as price, but it is definitely the leader over the other three. No question uh, as far as quality and service. So we're not giving budget numbers here. We're giving realistic what real people pay to fly down unless you're maybe going to a uh, travel agent and they're taking advantage of you or you're going through some bad website. I don't know how people are even coming up with the kind of numbers that they are because they're not realistic. Nicaragua really does cost this little. It's amazing how cheap it is to live here. It's amazing how cheap it is to travel here. And often the challenge is getting people to believe it. And people who sometimes uh, have had a bad experience um, or for some reason are not happy with Nicaragua, use how cheap it is to try to make it sound like, oh, it can't really be that cheap. We must be saying something to pad those numbers. We must be coming up with a way. But when we do hard numbers, when you take actual prices from the gas station, actual prices from the power company, actual prices from the airlines, 
life here is very inexpensive under normal circumstances. Now, similarly, it was mentioned the cost of rental cars, that being about $100 per day. Now, this is a real price, more or less, that's pretty accurate, but I think it's misleading the statement that was made that every single person who would come to Nicaragua would need a rental car every single day that they would be here. Of course, there's gonna be people who wanna do that, but that is very much a luxury and very much an edge case once again. The average person who's coming to Nicaragua is never going to rent a car. When I lived here, originally I rented a car only a handful of times, three or four times times. Having lived here now for the last three years, I've rented one absolutely never. However, there are other things you can do, but it's important to point out that the last times that I needed full day cars and I didn't have access to one of my own and I didn't have a friend who could drive me around, hiring someone to drive me around for an entire day was only $100. This is very important as a number. If you're talking about what you can get for a single day, if you want to have someone for a long period of time, $100 per day is not just enough to get a car, but to get it with a driver who takes on all the responsibilities and legalities of driving you around. Not that you're not allowed to drive. If you're an American, Canadian, European, or whatever, chances are your license is going to let you drive in Nicaragua. That's not generally a big deal. The problem is, is that if you are driving, there's some liabilities to that, of course. And even if you're not in any legal hot water, if you're in an accident, it may tie up your time on your vacation, things that you don't want to do. Hiring a driver, someone who is a professional driver, who one, knows the laws and knows how to deal with the police, just knows how to deal with things um, and takes that responsibility because they're being paid to, uh, can go a long way if you're here on a vacation to protecting your vacation. The last thing you want to do is have just a minor fender bender and spend a whole bunch of that time, even if nothing else goes wrong, just standing around waiting for police to show up or waiting in a police station to fill out paperwork or whatever, and heaven forbid something worse happens and you may find yourself unable to take your flight home. Those are all things you can avoid and that's, I think, a good example of two things. One, just how cheap things are here in Nicaragua, that what we assume is the cost for renting a car it would actually include with no particular effort, like renting a car takes a whole bunch of effort. There's only a few places in the country where you can do it. You have to do all kinds of paperwork. You have to commit to the amount of time. But if you're hiring someone on a per day basis to drive you around with their car, you have a lot more flexibility. You don't have to have all that proof of paperwork. You don't have to be of a certain age. You don't have to have certain types of insurance because you're paying for them to have all those things. There's a completely different experience that is so much more legit luxurious, so much cheaper, so much more practical, so much more functional, and you can enjoy your vacation rather than driving. Now, of course, some of you may just want to drive, and that's fine. Like, if that's what you enjoy doing and you want to rent a car, absolutely, just be aware that you're doing something that's outside of the norm, and you're going to pay a price premium for the privilege of doing so because it's not the standard. Most people are just going to ride around either with a hired driver to get them from point to point. They're going to take some kind of shuttle service, like the Ashimche shuttle that takes tourists around the country using public transportation, which not a lot of people want to do, but those who do, it's super cheap and easy and safe or you can hire a driver there's so many alternatives and that's my other point is that so often the things that cost a lot in Nicaragua or appear to cost a lot is when people are bringing a North American mentality of this is how I would do it in America so this is how I'm going to try to do it here and again nothing wrong with that but it's important to understand that that generates, in most circumstances, a perception of things being much more expensive than they actually are, or than they are in a comparative sense. Anytime you go to a different location, it doesn't matter where it is, anywhere, you have to accommodate for the fact that they are different places, and comparing cost should never be done in a hard and fast way, because it's the overall experience. Now, of course, everybody's experience differs, so we have to look at societal norms. But what people often do when looking uh, in, in one particular way is they look at, well, I want to exactly replicate something that I chose because it was the cheap set of conditions in one place. Whatever you do in America, for example, you're going to a new city, you're flying into Des Moines for the day, you're coming in by plane, you have to drive around and go to a bunch of different locations in America like over a course of a few days, naturally we're going to rent a car. That is the American response based on a number of factors, including that public transportation often doesn't go where you need to go. Public transportation is not generally acceptable for normal people to use. It is somewhat expensive, generally not very, and often not super safe. It's inconvenient and hiring a driver would be astronomically expensive and out of the question. So because of that, we choose renting a car in America. If you're coming to Nicaragua, 
All those factors flip. Public transportation is widely accepted. It's very safe. It is super cheap and it goes almost anywhere you could possibly want to go. It's a completely different world. If you do need to have a private car, getting a driver is ridiculously cheap to the point that it may actually be cheaper than renting a car without a driver because the factors are just wildly different. And so if we look at it from a, what does it cost to get around to different points that we reasonably want to get to, Nicaragua comes out as way, way less expensive than the US. But if we say, how do we just replicate not the experience, but the acts that we do to get that experience in the United States? Yes, Nicaragua will probably still come out cheaper, but not by the orders of magnitude, not to the degree that it would come out cheaper if we were to apply it in a more logical way. You just can't take how things are done in one place and move it to another. Another great example is if there's, a, if there's a specific food that you like that you can only get in Portland, Oregon. It's, it's made in a little, you know, it's, it's one lady makes it on a street corner. It's a special candy bar. She makes it at home and she sells it for $1 in Portland, Oregon. You then move to Thailand. You say, I have to have that candy bar, not a candy bar, not a candy bar like that, not something that satisfies me in a similar way, but I have to have that exact one from that exact person. And I need her to put it in a box, ship it and sell it to me on the street in Thailand, even if she wasn't shipped along with it, you could be looking at $100 per candy bar instead of $1. And it's easy to say, oh, it's so expensive to live in Thailand because you're comparing this contrived non-adjusted factor. But if you're looking at what does food cost in each one, what does a candy bar that you would eat as a local in each one, Thailand is going to be a lot cheaper than Portland. So it's important when we're talking about whether a place is more or less expensive that we always do it in this comparative way, not in a hard, we found a way to get a, a single number way, an under the hood artifact of the overall living experience, because that will always be misleading. And that is a way that people try to trick you as to how expensive places are, is by looking at those prices. And often it's how we try to trick ourselves. And often we do trick ourselves because uh, when we go to a new place, we often don't adapt and we say, this is how I would do it. This is what I want to do. We've talked about this a lot with things like real estate agents and how people end up in really bad housing situations because they didn't do things the Nicaraguan way, which admittedly is very hard, uh, but try to do it in a North American way, which we should know doesn't apply here and will always result in bad, bad things happening or always put us in a, in a position of great risk. Um, by doing that, yes, people are going to report, oh, it was so expensive, so this bad thing happened to me, or I paid way too much for it. I didn't get the value I was expecting, but it's because they were somehow expecting to be able to transport an identical experience rather than finding out how much the Nicaragua experience would cost. That, I think, is key. It's not about moving the experience. When we're doing a price comparison of moving an American or Canadian or whatever experience that you have specifically into another place, and likewise, and someone pointed out, well, we can't sell because I did a, a thing where I talked about why we drive 90 minutes to go to a price mart. I said, well, I live five minutes from a price mart in the United States, so that's cheaper. You can't use that example. Yes, of course. We always know that you can take any specific thing. That is my whole point that we're looking at the big picture that as an average across society, essentially everything is cheaper. Everything is easier. Everything is safer. There's going to be very specific situations where you say, well, I have in, in the United States, I have a panic room and it, it's an underground vault and it's out in the middle of the Midwest and it's a million miles from anywhere. And no one knows about it. And I've managed to keep it a secret. And I hire a military force to stand on top of it and protect me. And I'm safer than anywhere in Nicaragua. Yep, that's probably true. But you could replicate that in Nicaragua for less money and be just as safe. Just no one has ever done that because it's crazy, right? It's, it, we can't take those specific things and use them in that way. It makes no sense. And that it's a big problem trying to compare one place against another because until you've moved, until you've determined if you like the new lifestyle and everyone's lifestyle is different and there are many lifestyles. There's many different lifestyles in the US, in Canada, in Europe and in Nicaragua and Trying to compare all of them is very difficult, but what we do know is essentially anything you do in Nicaragua, no matter what it is you want to do, live on the ocean, own land, you know, uh, eat, go out to eat, all those things on average aren't just a little bit cheaper, but are a lot cheaper. You're really going to struggle to find an example of something that doesn't come out that way, whether it's by the overall lifestyle 
or the hard cost. But at times, there are hard costs that are going to be more. And some examples of that are your white goods, that is your home appliances. Typically, you're going to pay just a little bit more here than you would in the United States and often than you would in Canada, although that's a little bit easier to beat. Uh, but that's not always the case. When you're looking at direct costs, sometimes we're able to get things like from China or other parts of Asia a little bit cheaper than in the US. It does happen, but it is the exception, not the rule. And at other times you have um, the, the lifestyle thing, right? We tend to purchase smaller units here. We tend to purchase more efficient air conditioners here. We tend to purchase, like there's a little bit of differences in how people live here that also makes it cheaper. So again, hard cost versus lifestyle cost, we have to adapt. Likewise, there was also a discussion on the channel where they're talking about laptops. And this was used as an example. And I think this is a perfect example of how to point out when someone is trying to contrive something, right? And we've pointed out a lot. Laptops are the perfect example of a category of things. Laptops, video game machines, desktops, servers, all those kinds of things. Things that most people don't buy very often, very few people buy often, are more expensive here and more expensive in every sense, right? They're more expensive on a hard cost basis. You get less for your money. It's not just that you're gonna pay more than you would in the US. You'll generally get a lesser device. Uh, it will be harder to get. The selection will be smaller. You'll probably travel farther to do it. All those things, buying a laptop here is a huge problem, but it is a tiny percentage of any normal person's budget. And by normal person, I mean all people I've ever heard of. I have never met a person and I work in IT and have done so for more than 30 years, I have never once in my life encountered a person, more than 30 years, 35 years, I've never encountered any person who purchases so many computers, probably because I purchase more than anyone I've ever met, who purchases so many that it would even begin to affect their overall cost of living here. You can't buy enough technology to reasonably make it move the bar. Nicaragua is so cheap that even if you had to pay double, which you don't, for a laptop or a desktop or anything like that, you would not even care because let's say you wanted to get a really expensive laptop. Let's say a MacBook Pro, right? It's $2,000 in the US. So let's just imagine you're going to spend 4,000 here. You're certainly not, but let's just imagine. This is the wildest scenario, right? We're coming up with something ridiculously expensive and giving it an, a ridiculously expensive markup to make a point. $2,000 more. Typically, if you're renting a place here for three to four hundred dollars, that's going to be pretty close to a thousand dollars cheaper per month than an equivalent rental in the United States, right? A thousand dollars per month. If you're eating normally here, you're going to be saving somewhere between one hundred and one thousand dollars per month versus the United States. Some people will only save a few dollars, some people will save many times that. Some people could be saving $5,000 a month. I'm not quite sure how you would do that, but in theory you could. But let's just keep it to a reasonable number and say $500. If you're saving $1,000 per month on your rent and $500 per month on your food, plus you're probably saving on your car, probably saving on your gas, probably saving on your electric, probably saving on this and that and everything else, and you take that savings and say, okay, my laptop cost me an extra $2,000, but I save $1,500 per month. Well, that means it only takes less than six weeks before my overall cost of living has covered the extra cost of that laptop. You would have to buy a new device of the equivalent value of that MacBook at 100% markup every six weeks just to break even. Find me someone who is doing that. That is very hard. Now, if you're a business and you have to buy tons of them, that's a little bit different. And that's also important that we mention that if you're in a position where you're doing that, right? I just came back from Bolivia. One of the things I did while in Bolivia, I bought a laptop, right? I, not everyone who was there had all their laptop allowances used. We were able to get laptops at better prices than here and almost as good as the United States. So we took advantage of the situation to update a laptop. Just a cheap one, but we got one, right? And so. Sometimes there's creative answers, and yes, it's a big pain. In the United States, you would never accept, oh, get on a plane and fly to another country as a way to get a laptop, but you would accept, well, I'm going to be in Mexico on a vacation. I'm gonna pick up a blanket because it's gonna be half the prices in the US. So Americans do have this mentality. It's not that it doesn't exist, it's that it exists for completely different items than we would do so 
when you live in Nicaragua. Things are very reversed. You wouldn't fly somewhere to get a blanket. We have very cheap blankets here, but laptops are very expensive. So those things you try to get when you're somewhere else. Not everyone who lives in Nicaragua, not everyone who moves to Nicaragua, not everyone who's vacationing in Nicaragua is going to take the effort to go to somewhere else or naturally travel somewhere else and use that time to get a laptop. But the majority definitely do. And when you're in the United States, whether you're there to deal with some paperwork or you're visiting family or you're passing through, if you were willing to take a little bit of effort to pick up a laptop while you were there, you could do that specific shopping while in the US and make it not an issue for Nicaragua. Or you can simply pay to have one shipped to Nicaragua if you need the selection, or you can buy what's readily available here. And it's certainly not going to cost double, but it will cost quite a bit more. You have lots of options. And that's how real people live in Nicaragua, is we have to be a little bit creative when it comes to the things that are expensive here, just as people who live in the United States, for example, don't want to pay outrageous tax rates. And so they do creative things like move to Nicaragua, where they're able to fix that as well. And of course, if you really do live in Nicaragua, not just traveling as a tourist, then you have these huge potential tax advantages depending on where you're coming from. And those themselves often offset all other things. Even if Nicaragua cost more, you would still be able to live cheaper, but it doesn't, it costs less. So it's this big picture. It's looking at the whole thing. I have never found, when, when someone says, oh, but it's more expensive, you can tell where they're trying to manipulate the numbers to make it sound like it's going to cost more. But who do you know that is buying hundreds of laptops over the course of five years? You probably know no one. And if they are, it's a business, it's a different situation. But as individuals, how many laptops, how many televisions, how many, and televisions, we buy those locally and they're about the same price. Yeah, it's a little bit more, but it's about the same price. How many do you need? How often is that a purchase that affects you? And like we've said in other episodes, chances are your purchasing behavior is going to change as well. You will almost certainly, not everyone, but almost certainly purchase fewer electronic devices here because we just purchase less. It's, it's part of the lifestyle change. Now, it's kind of unfair, right? That's why we don't talk about that under normal circumstances, is that when you move to Nicaragua, you're probably going to stop buying so many of the things that you buy in the United States. Your lifestyle will change. Not everyone. And that's a it's a it's a pretty cheating way of comparing, right? It's easy to say, well, we simply buy half as much, so everything costs half as much. Well, that's not true, right? The individual things still sometimes cost more, sometimes cost less, and that we don't buy as much is a different type of advantage, and it's worth thinking about, it's worth being aware of, but what if you don't buy less? That could easily be the case, it wouldn't be fair to use those. Or what if you buy nothing in the US, and when you move here, you also buy nothing? You're not gonna have that advantage, you shouldn't use that as a calculation. But it is worth noting that chances are to some degree, whether it's 5% or 50%, your purchasing will decrease simply because of a culture that does not encourage that purchasing. So there's a lot of factors here and it goes on and on and on. And the same thing we was also mentioned hotel rooms, right? In the same conversation with how much flights cost and how much uh, uh, rental cars cost, it was mentioned that while well, hotels, if you're here on vacation, is gonna be a hundred dollars a night because what American wants to stay for cheaper than that. But again, it's not fair. Yes, there are hotel rooms in Nicaragua that will cost in excess of $100 a night. There are plenty of them. The Hilton Princess, even the Doubletree could hit $100. The uh, Intercontinental or uh, Los Portales in, in uh, Chinandega. There are places that are quite nice that are going to charge that much. However, people who are looking to spend $100 on those would be spending at least $200 for an equivalent in the United States. So it's still important to say, but that's that's a contrived situation. You're looking at someone who would spend 200 in the US, now they're spending half. You can't say, oh, that's so expensive. You have to say, oh, that's half. But people who are normally staying in a lot of places that might be $100, if they're gonna look at the equivalent here, that could easily be 30 to $60. It's not super cheap, it's not free, but it's a reasonable amount of money. I just came back from Bolivia. Now this is Bolivia, not Nicaragua, but I stayed in amazing Airbnbs and they range from $20 on the cheapest to about $35 on the high end. That's a big swing, but it's still a very affordable range. I was not being cheap. I looked in the areas that my staff told me were ideal. These were the most expensive areas or nearly the most expensive areas in the city. I looked at some of the nicest apartments. I only looked for those in the sizes that I need. I didn't look for them. How could I spend the most money? But I looked for what is the nicest thing I could get that was in the you know single bedroom it's just for one person that didn't have amenities that made no sense for me but were in absolutely ideal locations and these are the price ranges that I ended up with this was as much as I could spend while getting the value anything more would have been just throwing money away that's not me being cheap that's just what it costs to travel 
under those conditions. Of course, if I had a family, it would cost more. But if I had a family in the US, it would cost more as well. So those things are all different. So when looking, and, and then those numbers are going to equate to Nicaragua. Yeah, you're probably not going to find an Airbnb for $20, but you might find one for $40 or $50. Now, if you're going to be on the beach, it's going to be more. It's going to be $100. So if you were looking at the same thing in the United States, you'd be looking at much lower prices, right? There's no way you're going to be able to get for uh, $80 to $100 per night a full apartment on the Pacific Ocean anywhere in the U.S. It's just never going to happen, right? Things are just much more expensive. So when you're comparing apples to apples, you're going to find huge cost savings. Of course, some people are going to want to spend lots of money. Some people are going to want a lot of luxury. And Nicaragua offers some places that are very luxurious. There's not nearly as many. They're going to be a lot more limited, but you can go down to Iguana. You can go down to Hermosa. You can go down to San Juan del Sur. You can go into Managua and you can find restaurants that are quite expensive. You can find hotels that are quite expensive. You can find Airbnbs. You can find resort areas that are very expensive. They're few and far between, but they certainly exist. And you can spend that money. However, nowhere are you going to find that is going to be equivalent to something in the United States at the same price. It is going to be cheaper here no matter what it is you're looking at. And it's even when it comes down to alcohol, it costs barely over a dollar for a beer. It costs only like $10 for a giant bottle of rum. The things that we do here are very cheap. However, if you want alcohol that is only available in the US that has not been imported to Nicaragua and you want to import it yourself, this can be outrageously expensive. So it's all in how you compare. I know this is a long rant, but I think it's a really important bit of information that so many people, and it's not that many, right? But there's a number of people who have some perception that, or some reason to provide a perception that Nicaragua is very expensive or reasonably expensive. And I'm really shocked that at least three people recently, and I know that's not a very big number, have made the claim that Nicaragua costs a lot of money, but I can't get them to give me, so far, I'm making a request here, so we'll give them the benefit of the doubt that some of them are going to provide it now. But in some cases, I have asked over and over again, where was all this money spent? Because they're saying that, you know, they can't possibly live. That One person actually made the claim that you need a million dollars to be able to move to Nicaragua. Yet we know that there are thousands of people here without a million dollars who moved and partially because it's so cheap. The story we hear on the ground is there are people who move here because they have no other choice. It's the only place that they can afford, meaning it is the cheapest place that they can get to. Of course, there's some place in the world cheaper, but it may be really expensive to get to because it's super far away or maybe it has a really difficult entrance uh, requirement or something of that nature. But of places they can get, Nicaragua is the only place they can afford. And it's a problem that Nicaragua faces that they sometimes attract people who are unable to afford anywhere else in the world world and because they're the cheapest place that is accessible they basically take the equivalent of financial refugees from North America and sometimes Europe that can be good but it can also be bad right there's a lot of people who end up here and are a little bit sometimes sad or disgruntled because they're stuck here they're not actually upset with Nicaragua they're upset with their situation um, and that's unfortunate right but Nicaragua provides an opportunity for people to live so much cheaper than the United States at the same level, but also allows them to live at levels they may not be able to live at the United States at all. And uh, <clears throat> because of that, because of that, right, we know that here in the real world, right, people come here because, in, in many circumstances, because it's so cheap, because it's so affordable. Right? We wish that everyone was coming here because they loved it. We wish that they were coming because this is their dream location. We chose this intentionally, right? We are here. The fact that it is very inexpensive, that it's very affordable for us is purely a bonus, a big bonus, a really significant bonus. But it is not the factor that drove us here. We certainly considered Spain and places in South America and other places in Central America and Mexico for sure, and bits of Europe and kicked around bits of Asia, some of them actually cheaper. But we chose Nicaragua because it provides everything that we want or the best mix that is actually available in the real world. Nowhere is perfect for sure. But many people come here simply because they can't afford to go home. Right? The United States often prices itself out of even Americans' budgets. And that's really important to understand that for people, when there's no way to fudge the numbers, this is where they come when it's less expensive. Nobody goes back to the United States because it's cheaper. They only go back because they can afford it, because they can splurge. And that's a very important way to look at things. So. I hope, I hope this spawns a lot of discussion. I hope you get down in the comments and let me know where you think, if you do, think that there's something that costs more in Nicaragua, what is it? 
right? And certainly there are things, right? Let's be really clear. Laptops and all kinds of technology things do cost more, but there are ways to mitigate that if you need to. There are uh, you know, appliances cost equal or possibly a little bit more. And you can't really work around that very easily as far as I know, but it's not the end of the world. It's a tiny drop in the bucket compared to your big budget. A lot of people look at things they don't do very often as significant and don't look at their everyday expenses as being important when it really is, right? Your rent and your food are really the only things that matter. These are the things for, until you're ultra rich, in which case you shouldn't be worried about what it costs to live here anyway. It's so cheap for you, right? If you're making $20,000 a month and you're worried about, oh, my laptop costs a little bit extra, why? What, what is going on, right? But if you're a normal person who actually has to, you know, be a little bit careful with what they spend. And if you could save $500 here or there, that would be something you notice and be appreciated for any normal, reasonable person, for any person I've ever met, both in the US and in Nicaragua and in Europe, Anyone I've ever met anywhere in the world, I've never met people for whom the kinds of savings you get here on food and housing and transport and, and assistance and staff and all those things wouldn't be met with a very noticeable positive impact. Because honestly, if you're making $10 million a year, you will still feel the benefits. You may not outweigh them compared to some of the benefits of somewhere else. Maybe the tax structure of Switzerland is better for you. Maybe you have so much money that the food quality difference, because it is better and the variety is certainly better in Italy, outweighs the cost savings and other benefits of Nicaragua. Absolutely. That's a possibility. And that's a possibility at any price range. But I've never met a person who made so much money who wouldn't feel that the price benefits, the cost of living benefits of Nicaragua weren't something that they felt on a day-to-day -day basis. And I've certainly never met anyone who purchases so many things that aren't housing and food that they wouldn't see it as a cost benefit. Not that those people don't exist, but they are very rare and at outrageously high income levels under normal circumstances. It's extremely difficult earning less than several million dollars per year to purchase that much non-housing, non-food, non-services items to amount to a point where it would offset the, the benefits you get from those, the financial benefits you get from those. So get down those comments. I want a lot of discussion on this. I want to know where you agree, where you disagree, where you think it costs more, why you think it costs more. And please be aware, if you give me a price, I want to know where these numbers are coming from. I'm certainly open to that they exist, but I'm going to follow up. This is a small country. I can get to all these places cheaply. So I know something must be wrong. I want to follow up and figure out what's going on because, you know, if people are getting scammed, we need to identify the difference between cost of living and the cost of getting scammed and not realizing it or not catching it, right? And those are things we want to correct for people. People who are getting that impression that it might cost a lot here, we need to figure out what they're doing wrong because a lot of people do make these mistakes and somehow end up bleeding a lot of money when it doesn't make any sense and they're not getting anything for the value. So like and subscribe, share on social media, tell your friends, family, let them know the show is still going on. We got more content, I believe, coming up from Bolivia as well. And I'm glad to be back here in Nicaragua. I had a great time in Bolivia, but it is good to be home. And as always, if you'd like to support the channel and help me offset my cost of living here and doing all the show and everything else, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. And I will see all of you tomorrow.